Good evening, everyone. I know that a lot of our participants, uh, for you, this is the first time joining the online forum. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Wen Xing from National Human Rights Museum in Taiwan, and I'm also the moderator of this online forum today. So this event is supported by simultaneous interpretation. And uh, as the moderator, I have muted your microphone and you don't have to worry about uh, your camera because your cameras are off. So we are not going to see uh, you in front of the screen. Thank you for coming in. Now I announce the official beginning of our online forum tonight and good evening. As I said before, I'm Wen Xing from National Human Rights Museum of Taiwan, and I'm also the moderator of this online forum today. And this evening, we are hosting the very first talk for the firm at Forum on Migration and Human Rights in 2021. Starting from last year, we have invited, invited partners from different organizations to give talks on this topic. For example, we have speaker from Serve the People Association, Taoyuan, talking about migrant workers facing the challenges posed by the pandemic, and also the curator of What a Brilliant Time Art Festival, talk about the exhibition held at a women's rights museum presenting personal narratives and stories of female migrants or migrant workers. And also, uh, Jia Yan from the Garden of Hope Foundation was also invited to talk about the difficulties faced by female migrant domestic workers. From January to June this year, we will continue to have NGO workers, museum practitioners, experts, and scholars as our keynote speakers for this online forum. And uh, like this talk we're going to have today, they will share different cases and stories ranging from migrant fishermen inmates, the brokerage systems of migrant worker employment, new immigrant life story workshop exhibitions or educational activities related to the migrant curated uh, by the museum promotion of migrant themed board games on campus, second generation immigrants perspectives, etc. Today we will see how NGOs and museums raise public awareness of this issue through different methodologies and perspectives. This online forum will be conducted once a month for one hour each time, and I will be the interpreter, uh, the moderator, excuse me, moderator, and give an opening introduction. Then the speaker will be given 45 minutes to talk. We will reserve five to 10 minutes for online participants to ask questions. Please feel free to leave your comments or questions in the chat box in the upper right corner. After the talk, I will consolidate all your questions and have them answered all together by our speaker. The event will support it, be supported by simultaneous interpretation from Mandarin into English. To switch to English channel, please use your language. First issue is accommodation. I think uh, some of you may have heard of this from uh, Li Hua. They went to the collapsing bridge in Nanfang Ao in Yilan, and there you see that uh, the uh, the incident shows a big issue because many of these fishermen lived on ships. Even when they were off work, they didn't live in a um, comfortable housing. They lived on ships. As a result, Um, we see that when the Nanfang Ao bridge collapsed, six of the fishermen were still on the ship, so they died because of the accident. For a long time, the um, accommodation or lodging issue has been discussed a lot, but things haven't improved yet. And uh, many of them live in a very narrow and small environment. Sometimes on some ships, there isn't air conditioning and there isn't a comfortable bathroom or restroom. I'm sure that there isn't a bathroom, but even the toilet is very dirty and very uncomfortable. I 
think um, when you see it, you wouldn't want to use it. Um, and another issue is over time and working hours, you see two sentences here. Uh, if fishermen want to have overtime fees, then how would the uh, uh, operator survive? And the second sentence here says, you go to argue, but anyway, there wouldn't be any result if you want to ask for overtime fees. I think these sentences probably come from, sound, sound like coming from employers, but these actually come from two different um, cases. And these sentences were said by government officials from um, labor bureaus. This shows that even though these fishermen are protected by the Labor Standards Act, but in reality, their working hours are long, but it's almost impossible for them to have overtime fees. And you can also imagine that on fishing ships, there isn't really um, working hours, documentation, or records. So some operators simply say that, oh, a lot of times on the sea they are sleeping, they don't really work that long. Then it becomes impossible to really track their working hours. These fishermen may think that even if they are on the sea, they still uh, are working. They, for example, patch the nets. And sometimes they have to finish their meals within 10 minutes to in order to continue working. And also, uh, they are very busy on ships. But on these ships, there isn't really a clear record of their working hours. So oftentimes, it becomes a Rashomar. It becomes impossible to really track their working hours. Some operators know that the fishermen's working hours are long, so they are willing to make up for that. They are willing to give more um, salaries to their fishermen. But uh, they don't really, it's impossible for the operators to follow the, the the law to compensate, but some operators are unwilling to do so. They are unwilling to pay more to um, migrant fishermen. And ultimately, when they cannot get more money, they want to change their employer, they want to change their job. So in many negotiating meetings, the result is that the fishermen and the employer agree that they change their job, but uh, it's impossible for the fishermen to get more overtime fees. Another issue, one of the main issues that I want to talk with you about overseas employment. Um, there's a major difference between domestic and overseas employment. In terms of domestic employment, it applies to inshore fisheries, and overseas employment applies to offshore fisheries. I want to tell you that um, Um, I didn't know about this before. Even though Taiwan is a small island, in reality, in terms of global offshore fisheries industry, Taiwan is very famous and renowned. According to Greenpeace data, we see that Taiwan's offshore fisheries ranks top number two worldwide. Taiwan has 1,100 long-haul fishing vessels, and one tuna uh, raw fish piece out of three comes from a Taiwanese ship. And Taiwan plays a very important role in the supply chain of fish worldwide. And also, according to a report from the reporters, in 
Central and West Pacific Ocean, Taiwan has the most、uh, vessels, and also two times as many as、uh, Japan, which is the second. However, but Taiwan is a kingdom of offshore fisheries, but this kingdom is actually supported by many slaves. Well. A lot of fishermen are foreign or migrant、uh, fishermen. Usually, on a ship, there are only a few Taiwanese people: the captain and the deputy captain. In Taiwan, in many cases, when we enjoy the reputation of a kingdom of offshore fisheries, we really see how this kingdom has been established. In 2015, there was an incident in the EU. The EU put forward a yellow card warning to Taiwanese fisheries. It has to do with IUU, meaning illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing behavior. Taiwan's fisheries agency wanted to respond to EU's move, so. In a hurry, the FA legislated three laws, including,、um, as you can see on the slide, at the time,、uh, Tiwa and some other NGOs already started to pay attention to the workers' rights of fishermen. Even though the EU gave a yellow card warning, it wasn't just for the worker rights of fishermen; it was actually for IUU behavior. However, because of the advocacy of NGOs in Taiwan, the legislations also included some protection for migrant fishermen. Let's take a look. Uh, let's make a comparison between domestic and overseas employment. Overseas employment fishermen are not governed by the Ministry of Labor; rather, they are governed by the Fisheries Agency. The Fisheries Agency doesn't understand anything about worker rights. So now, let's make a comparison between the two different situations: domestic and overseas employment. For Uh, overseas employment,、uh, fishermen are governed by the fisheries agency, and the laws are also different. It's not the Labor Service Act and the、uh, Labor Standards Act. Rather, it's a offshore fisheries act that governs、uh, the relevant.、Um, Behavior, for example, the minimum wage is only four hundred fifty U.S. dollars, which is about thirteen thousand five hundred and two dollars. This number is way lower than the minimum wage in Taiwan. As for working hours,、uh, overseas employed、uh, fishermen is only protected by the、uh, act that every day the rest time. Cannot be lower than ten hours, but、uh, these ten hours may not be ten hours in a row. And every month, the number of resting days shouldn't be fewer than four days, which means that there are twenty-six days of working, which is not corresponding to our Labor Standards Act, because according to that, we have to have uh, uh, more holidays, more days off. Sorry. And、uh, as for, and there is also another condition. When needed, employee and employer can negotiate their days off. For example, during fishing,、um, the the operators, the employers, don't have to comply with this act anymore because of busy fishing. As for docking frequency,、um, overseas employment. Frequency is way lower. Domestic, you see that once every day or once every 
two weeks. As for overseas employment, it's once every few months or once every two years. So we see that uh, these fishermen for a long time are isolated on their ships. They only uh, work and live together with their crew members and captains. As for brokeries fees, um, the brokery fee is lower than in the case of domestic uh, employ employment. You can imagine. So we can actually imagine that, for example, if you are a worker from Indonesia, if you want to work overseas, would you opt for uh, as a domestic employee laborer or a labor employee offshore. Of course, in terms of these uh, conditions, you would you choose the better one. Who would actually choose for these offshore employment? Of course, they would be those ones who could not afford the brokerage fee. So they would be at the very bottom of the whole system and they could only afford that broker fees uh, for the offshore employment, if you had no option, if you are desperate, you probably would choose uh, this kind of employment. If you can earn some money after a few years, you save money, you get home, and then you save up enough of money to enter into the system of domestic employment, which offer a relatively speaking better conditions of labor. And in terms of the number of offshore employment, uh, it's really hard to uh, really uh, capture the exact number, even though they are employed by Taiwanese uh, ship owners, but a lot of them may not uh, uh, or call the port of Taiwan, some of them may come to Taiwan first and then they uh, get on board, but they can actually get on board along the coast of Indonesia and then after the termination of their contract, they can get off board um, at some other places, which means that they may never come to Taiwan during the process. So how do we get this total number of these offshore employees uh, laborers? So that really depends on those uh, reports filed by the fish, uh, the fishing boat owners. However, there are a lot of uh, hidden figures in that number of estimates. And now I would like to talk about another uh, event. When Superyanda was beaten to, to death, the prosecutor in Pingdong didn't really investigate this case thoroughly. Uh, before his death, there were three video clips shot by his friend, but uh, in, in which Superyanda spoke uh, Central Java language, but uh, the court interpreter didn't understand that language, and the prosecutor believed that the video clips were not really related to the case, so the case was closed. However, later, because of a uh, in-depth investigation, um, the prosecutor decided to reopen this case for investigation, but uh, the crew members already had returned to Indonesia. So we did one thing at the time. We found those crew members working with Superyando, and we persuaded some of them to return to Taiwan to testify. Uh, uh, some of them were not willing because they had very bad impression about Taiwan. But because of some support and donation, Sukri, uh, one of them, Return to Taiwan to testify. Actually, uh, here we cite three sentences from him. Actually, he spoke a lot else. He said, I dare not resist, otherwise it would have been me being beaten. I could only see others being beaten. And the abuser, he said, the abuser cut two holes on the knees of Superyanto. And also, at the very beginning, there was already beating and fighting on the ship on their way to the fish farm. And also, he said that when Superyanto was 
being abused. Um, uh, he claimed the the injury for Superyondo, and when the body of Superyondo was processed and frozen in a fridge for fish, what did the captain do? Well, he kept on fishing for three days, and finally, some fishermen asked the captain, saying, "Why do we keep working when someone already died?" And finally, the captain decided to navigate the ship back to Taiwan. Well, this case shows what we have been talking about today, which is the situation, the working conditions of fishermen on the sea. And also, this case shows that Taiwan doesn't have enough court interpreting resources. But that's a different topic. Let me put it aside for now. So I just talked about two cases,、uh, Te Hongxing and Superyanto, which took place in 2013 and 2015. So these、uh, incidents took place before the three legislations、uh, took effect. But even after the legislations. Have their situation, have their conditions really improved? Well, according to a recent report, it says that,、uh, well, because of some abuse cases, the American administration decided to、uh, suspend a Taiwanese ship、um, At a, a Taiwanese port, because they found a lot of abuses and violence on that Taiwanese ship. So similar stories repeat themselves. And even after the three legislations, things haven't really improved that much. Oh, maybe、um, in the interest of time, let me hurry up. So, how should we improve our laws and regulations to improve the conditions of fishermen? Well, now to the、um, prisoner topic. Well, after the fishermen were imprisoned, we contacted some lawyers, hoping that they could、um, defend them. And also, we talked with the Indonesian representative, hoping that they could pay for. Their lawyer fees because these six fishermen were employed overseas, so it was very difficult to apply for、um, volunteer lawyers. Finally, we found six lawyers to defend them, and、um, in the process, all the way to their sentencing and their imprisonment. Which took place in 2015, and since then, once every month, we went to the prison to pay visit to them. At the time, we didn't know what we could really do for them because the incident had already happened, and it was already in the judicial procedure. We couldn't do much, but、uh, we kept paying attention to this incident, and we were also worried about their situation in the prison. So once every month, we paid visit to them, and in this process, we、um, gathered a lot of support and resources from friends, from friends. So we. Uh, started to gather、uh, some resources and some books from Indonesia, hoping to give them some solaces. And also,、uh, we also、uh, bring some Indonesian dishes to them, and、uh, we also provided some. Again, my for my apology. So we have delayed a little bit, but I would still like to thank Camel for that fantastic sharing. I know that from our、uh, screen, you cannot see really clearly. So I would like to、uh, make some adjustments. In the interest of time. Because we're a little bit over time,、um, 
do we have any question from the floor? It is okay if you don't have any questions to ask now. Uh, please feel free to write to us after our talk today, and I will forward them uh, to our speaker. Thank you very much for your participation, and thank you, Camel, for your insightful uh, presentation. And some of our participants had issue of logging in. So today, after our talk, I would uh, send the link of the recorded footage of our conference uh, to you all. And also that would be available on our firm app official website, as well as our museum. So going forward, you're going to see uh, the link very soon. And another announcement about our next, next uh, talk. So uh, next uh, speaker will be talking about a workshop, a story for the new immigrants on the, the stories of their life. And uh, the speaker will be talking to us about the workshop and the conference uh, will date. The talk will take place at the end of February. I thank you for your participation and thank Thank you again, Camel, for that insightful presentation. And what's more important uh, is I would like to thank our two interpreters and Phoebe and Parker that have been working hard to deliver the speech simultaneously in English. And thank you very much for your participation and wish you a lovely evening and weekend and see you next time. Goodbye. So you, you can log off now. Thank you very much.